Hello everyone, I am Dr. Omkar Sangeeta Dilipraw Sononi from Team AFMG and today I welcome you all back on board for the discussion of a very important and a high yield topic from the subject of pediatrics and today we are going to discuss about some important respiratory diseases on which questions have been asked commonly in infants or in children so let's discuss those okay without any further delay let's start our discussion before that i would just like to highlight the points again that afmg has already begun its last batch for the june 2022 session also please feel free to join the afmg telegram group where you will be receiving all the updates as well as ample amount of mcqs to just go through daily apart from that also please download the afmg app where we are about to begin the test series so you can practice a lot of mcqs there itself okay and also don't forget to subscribe to the youtube channel with this i begin my discussion for today and first of all starting with a very important topic from the respiratory system of pediatrics and that is pneumonia okay why pneumonia is so much important but please remember pneumonia is the leading or the most common cause of infectious death okay so please remember it is the most common cause of infectious death in children it almost accounts for 15 percent of mortality in children who are less than 15 uh, less than five years of age group okay so please remember pneumonia is the leading cause of infectious death in children now there are some important one-liners that you need to remember about pneumonia the first one being which is the most common cause of bacterial pneumonia in children yes pneumonia can be due to some bacteria as well also it can be due to viruses so which is the most common cause of bacterial pneumonia in children the answer is same that as in adults the answer is streptococcus pneumoniae so please remember streptococcus pneumoniae which is also known as pneumococcus it is the most common cause of bacterial pneumonia in children as well as adults if they ask you the second most common cause or if streptococcus pneumonia is not an option then your answer should be haemophilus influenzae so please remember the second most common bacterial cause of pneumonia in children is haemophilus influenzae if i move further the next one liner says most common cause of viral pneumonia in children when they talk about viral pneumonia then your answer should be rsv that is respiratory syncytial virus okay most common cause of viral pneumonia in children is RSV or respiratory syncytial virus. Now, if they ask you most common cause of pneumonia in neonates, then the answer should be group B streptococcus. So please remember the answer of the question most common cause of pneumonia in neonates. It is group B streptococcus followed by E. coli. Okay, so please remember these are also the common organisms which are known to cause neonatal sepsis. Okay, so please remember these are the same organisms which will cause pneumonia as well as neonatal sepsis. Group B streptococcus followed by E. coli. If the question is most common, most common cause of pneumonia in infants with HIV. So please remember the answer will remain same whether it is an infant, child or an adult. If they mention about HIV positive individual, the most common cause of pneumonia worldwide remains the same and that is pneumocystis gerovesi. So please remember this is the important one. Pneumocystis gerovesi is the most common cause of pneumonia in a HIV positive individual irrespective of the age group. Then if I talk about the symptoms, usually in this the period will start with a prodromal period when the child will have maybe some low grade fever or the most important symptom would be your cough and sometimes there would be difficulty in breathing. Right? These are the most important two symptoms for which we need to look in the child. Along with that, definitely some child would be having the respiratory distress which can manifest as fast breathing. Fast breathing or rapid and shallow breaths are also called as tachypnea. But as we know, in children already there is an increased respiratory rate, around 40 to 60 breaths per minute. So how to, what is the cutoff for calling it as fast breathing in children? So if it is a 0 to 2 months old child, then more than 60 breaths per minute is considered to be tachypnea. So please remember if it is a 0 to 2 month old child more than 60 breaths per minute is considered to be tachypnea if it is if the child is from 2 to 12 months then more than 50 breaths per minute is considered tachypnea if a child is between 2 to 12 months more than 50 breaths per minute is considered tachypnea whereas if a child is between 1 to 5 years more than 40 breaths per minute is considered to be tachypnea more than 40 breaths per minute is considered tachypnea if it is a child between 1 to 5 years of age group now if i talk about the management of pneumonia usually pneumonia in children is managed according to the guidelines which are set by imnci 
that is integrated management of neonatal and childhood illnesses <clears throat> they have also given guidelines for other diseases like measles diarrhea dehydration okay so according to this there are two age groups the first age group is from 0 to 2 months whereas the second age group is from 2 months till 5 years and then according to the symptoms in the child we classify the child into three categories green category in this usually the patient is treated as an on an outpatient basis or maybe home treatment is given to the child if the child falls in the yellow category then we initiate the treatment and call the patient for the follow up whereas if the patient falls in the pink category that it is an indication that immediate admission or hospital referral should be done for that particular child right if i talk about pneumonia in details over here about the imnci guidelines first of all <coughs> important is you need to look for the cough or cold in the child also look for tachypnea right you need to count the respiratory rate of that child then also look for a important finding that is chest in drawing listen for strider strider means noisy breathing which is manifested mostly in upper respiratory or lower respiratory tract infections then also look for wheeze to just rule out asthma also look for some central sinuses that would be an indication of hypoxemia and also monitor oxygen saturation maybe using a pulse oximeter right after you assess all this if also look for any general danger signs are present if any general danger signs is present then the child would be classified directly into a very severe disease or a severe pneumonia that means in the pink category so what are the general danger signs usually so please remember if the child is unable to drink or feed normally okay if the child is not able to take the breastfeed then second if the child is vomiting maybe recurrent vomiting are noticed in the child third if the child has had a history of convulsions or maybe the child is convulsing right now or if the child is lethargic or is unconscious in all these conditions these are considered to be the general danger signs and the child needs urgent and immediate attention so that child would be classified into very severe disease or severe pneumonia in this if the child is convulsing then we definitely prefer giving a iv or a rectal diazepam also we check for hypoglycemia in this child and if their oxygen saturation is constantly dropping below 90% then in this condition we will start oxygen therapy in the child and admit the child immediately along with that we prefer giving the first dose of antibiotics and the first dose of antibiotics which is preferred apart from benzyl penicillin nowadays we preferred giving amoxicillin okay so injection of amoxicillin plus gentamicin is given okay so please remember we give the first dose of antibiotics amoxicillin plus gentamicin and refer the child immediately to a higher center or to a hospital please remember this then if the child does not have any of the danger signs but the child is having chest in drawing or maybe there is a strider in a calm child or even if there is fast breathing in this condition the child would be classified into the yellow category that is pneumonia in this we usually give amoxicillin to the child in the form of dispersible tablets for a period of 5 days generally right and after that we call the child for follow up in 2 days if it is not possible for the mother to bring the child for review or follow up in 2 days then we usually admit the child or refer the child to a higher center if chest and drawing is present and if any of the signs given above are not present that means no general danger sign is present oxygen saturation strider are all normal apart from that chest and drawing even fast breathing is also not present in this condition we classify the child into green category that is no pneumonia only the child is suffering from mild cough and cold in this condition we treat the wheeze of the child maybe we relieve the cough of the child with a syrup and then we call the mother for follow up after 5 days right so please remember these are the treatment guidelines which are given by imnci for the treatment of pneumonia on this questions have been commonly asked so please be pretty sure about this if i move further now the question is most common cause of acute coryza or common cold in children the most common cause of acute coryza or common cold in children not only in children whereas in adults also it is the same that is rhinovirus so please remember the most common cause of common cold or acute coryza is rhinovirus if they ask you about the most common cause of acute pharyngitis in children the answer would be streptococcus pyogenes okay so please remember the most common cause of acute pharyngitis in children is streptococcus pyogenes 
in streptococcus pyogenes infection or pharyngitis the child will likely suffer from maybe a low grade fever there can be even sore throat there would be tonsillar exudates there would be palatal petechiae all of these features can be present okay in cases of pharyng uh, streptococcus pharyngitis even a membrane can be present at times in the oropharynx in the or uh, in this condition please remember in streptococcus pharyngitis one important complication is that of acute rheumatic fever yes so please remember if a child is suffering from streptococcal pharyngitis then the body starts producing antibodies which are fighting against the m protein of streptococcus pyogenes but after a point of time this also start attacking the similar kind of protein which is present in our myocardium and therefore the child can suffer from even rheumatic heart disease apart from this the child can also suffer from a condition called as psgn that is post streptococcal glomerulonephritis so please remember it is due to the pathological mechanism of molecular mimicry or cross reactivity that the child develops either acute rheumatic fever rheumatic heart disease or post streptococcal glomerulonephritis after a pharyngitis history usually please remember so streptococcus pyogenes is a group a beta hemolytic streptococci in psgn there would be a characteristic history that the child was having sore throat or pharyngitis after which within a period of 2 or 3 weeks the child was brought to you with complaints of hematuria and hematuria in the question would be classically mentioned as cola colored urine please remember then if i talk about acute bronchiolitis guys so please remember bronchiolitis is inflammation of your lower airways that is your bronchioles and the most common age group which is affected in bron acute bronchiolitis is from 6 months till 2 years of age group so please remember 6 months till 2 years is the most commonly affected age group in cases of acute bronchiolitis and what is the most common cause question have been asked on this most common cause of acute bronchiolitis is rsv again so please remember respiratory syncytial virus or rsv is the most common cause of acute bronchiolitis whereas other viruses like the influenza virus para influenza virus or even the adenovirus are also known to cause acute bronchiolitis on examination usually if we see there would be a hyper inflated chest okay please remember on examination there would be hyper inflated chest and on auscultation on auscultation there would be two important findings first of all there would be a wheeze and second there would be crepts that is crepitations would be heard so wheezing and crepitations would be heard on auscultation in cases of acute bronchiolitis if i talk about treatment guys please remember treatment is generally supportive maybe if there is severe respiratory distress in this children then we can give a oxygen therapy right but in if they ask you specifically about the most specific treatment in cases of acute bronchiolitis due to rsv the answer would be nebulized ribavirin so ribavirin is a nebulized ribavirin ribavirin is a antiviral drug please remember and it is only given in cases of immunocompromised infants or children or if the child is on ventilator already only in this conditions nebulized ribavirin would be given in this child okay otherwise supportive therapy with oxygen uh, oxygenation is required if i move further talking about a very important condition and that is acute epiglottitis on this questions have been repeatedly asked this is also overlap from ent and therefore it is a very important topic if i talk about acute epiglottitis is it inflammation of your epiglottis or moreover the larynx so in cases of acute epiglottitis it is a pediatric airway emergency this is important please remember it is a pediatric airway emergency and therefore the child would need immediate attention in this case in this usually the child uh, the most common cause of acute epiglottitis is mark uh, is to be marked as streptococcus pneumoniae so please remember the most common cause of the most common organism causing acute epiglottitis is streptococcus pneumoniae yes so most of the books mention still it as hiv that is hemophilus influenza type b but please remember as in india now we have start included hiv hemophilus influenza type b vaccine in our national immunization schedule therefore the cases due to hiv of acute epiglottitis has substantially decreased and therefore streptococcus pneumoniae has become a more common cause of acute epiglottitis in india as well as worldwide please remember this if i talk about symptoms usually acute epiglottitis can begin with a very high grade fever which is very acute in onset it will suddenly start along with this definitely the child will experience respiratory distress along with this the 
calm child would be having a strider or noisy breathing important feature is drooling of saliva please remember as there is laryngeal edema due to inflammation of the epiglottis the child could not even swallow the saliva because it is really very painful and therefore the saliva is continuously drooling out from the mouth the child will attain a tripod position okay the child would sit in a tripod position to just relax himself right and the respiratory distress will uh, further severe and that can also cause hypoxemia or central cyanosis as well apart from this for diagnostic purposes usually we can perform a laryngoscopy okay so please remember on a laryngoscopy if we perform we will find a cherry red epiglottis on a laryngoscopy we will find a cherry red epiglottis that is a inflamed and swollen epiglottis would be found along with that we can also take a lateral x-ray neck if we take a lateral x-ray of neck as you can see in the image over here here you can see the inflamed epiglottis would resemble a thumb sign so please remember a very characteristic thumb sign is seen on the lateral x-ray of neck in cases of acute epiglottitis so this is a very important finding and this image has also been given in the examination multiple times so please remember this if i talk about treatment guys for treatment purposes definitely supportive care is required mostly oxygen uh, positive pressure ventilation is also required in this children okay along with that definitely antibiotics are given and mostly we prefer giving iv third generation cephalosporins like ceftriaxones are generally preferred so please remember third generation cephalosporins like cef uh, ceftriaxone are given for a period of almost 7 to 10 days in this children but now generally they mention about a clinical case of acute epiglottitis and the question generally asks you about the first step or mostly the next step okay in management of this children so the first or the next best step in management of cases of acute epiglottitis is early elective intubation this is the most important thing that you need to remember in this patients usually as there is laryngeal edema intubation in the later stages can become really difficult and we can lose the child even therefore the first and the most important step in cases of acute epiglottitis is early elective intubation next if i talk about the other condition that is acute ltb laryngotracheal bronchitis where there is inflammation of the larynx the trachea as well as the primary bronchus which is also known as croup right the most common cause of acute laryngotracheal bronchitis usually croup or acute laryngotracheal bronchitis is common in children up to 3 years of age right if i talk about the most common cause it is the para influenza virus so please remember para influenza virus is the most common cause of acute ltb or croup then this acute ltb has usually a less severe course as compared to acute epiglottitis it generally start with the viral prodromal period like with low grade fever even there can be respiratory distress in this children along with that at times there can be strider in this child as well and there is a very characteristic feature that is known as barking cough so barking cough is a characteristic feature noticed in cases of acute laryngotracheal bronchitis for diagnosis purposes we take a chest ray a uh, chest x-ray pa view on chest x-ray we will find there would be narrowing of the upper airway right so please remember one important one liner which comes usually the narrowest part in the pediatric airway previously it was at the level of the cricoid cartilage but now the answer is at the subglottis the narrowest part of the pediatric airway is at the level of the subglottis so in acute ltb or croup there is narrowing of this upper airway and this would resemble as the steeple of a church and therefore this is known as the steeple sign so please remember this is known as the steeple sign which is seen due to narrowing of the upper airway in a child right so please remember steeple sign is a feature of croup whereas thumb sign on a lateral x-ray neck is a sign of acute epiglottitis if i talk about treatment usually so please remember here we do not give any antiviral drug antibiotics don't have a role over here because it is a viral infection so here we generally give supportive care to this child like iv fluids oxygen therapy would be given if required okay all of that is given but no antibiotics have a role over here if the child is having a severe respiratory distress definitely then we give a single dose of dexamethasone okay so please remember single dose of steroid that is dexamethasone is generally preferred in this children along with that if the respiratory distress still persists and if there is hypoxemia then maybe 
Nebulized epinephrine can also be given in this children, right? Please remember this. If I move further, talking about the next condition that is laryngomalacia. This is a congenital anomaly, guys. Please remember, laryngomalacia is a congenital anomaly. Okay, and here the child presents mostly with strider, that is noisy breathing. Okay, the child is brought to you with strider mostly at around two weeks of life, and this strider generally increases up to six months of age. Right, so the child presents up to two weeks of life, and that can persist till six months of age. Now this strider, please remember, rather, please remember this important one-liner. Laryngomalacia is the most common cause of strider in infants. Okay, please remember, most common cause of strider in infants is laryngomalacia. Now this strider has an important feature. This strider generally increases on crying or on agitation. Whenever the child cries, the strider would increase. Whereas the strider would decrease if the child is lying in the prone position. So please remember on proning the strider will decrease right so these are the two important features of laryngomalacia then for diagnosis purposes we can perform a flexible laryngoscopy on flexible laryngoscopy a omega shaped epiglottis as you can see in the picture would be seen okay so a omega shaped epiglottis is seen in cases of laryngomalacia this image has come multiple times in the examination the one liner also most common cause of strider in infants that is laryngomalacia and a very important point also they have mentioned they have mentioned about laryngomalacia or the case and then they have asked you about the treatment so please remember laryngomalacia is a self limiting condition and in this no treatment is required so please remember usually no treatment is required but if you have reassurance in the option then that would be better okay so you will give reassurance to the parents that this is a self limiting condition no treatment is required and it will eventually subside by itself right so please remember this if i talk about cystic fibrosis so cystic fibrosis is a genetic condition guys usually more common in the western western countries it has autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance so please remember cystic fibrosis has autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance the mutation which is seen in cystic fibrosis is in the cftr gene so please remember mutation in cystic fibrosis is in the cftr that is cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator gene okay in the cftr gene there is a mutation this cftr gene is located on the seventh chromosome on the longer arm okay it is located on seventh chromosome on the long arm 7q okay please remember the cftr usually it is a protein which helps in synthesis or production of various secretions like the mucus okay it keeps the mucus or various secretions thin but if the cftr is not functional or it is dysfunctional in this case is what will happen the secretions rather than becoming thin they will rather become thick and really viscid okay they will become viscous right so please remember now if i talk about the symptoms in cystic fibrosis there are mainly problems which are associated with respiratory system otherwise cystic fibrosis can also affect other organs like the pancreas the liver intestines okay please remember multiple other organs can be affected but the most uh, common affected system of the organ are the respiratory is the respiratory system the child will have recurrent infections maybe recurrent bacterial or viral infections would be noticed in the children if they ask you about the most common infection in this child that is staph aureus so please remember the most common infection which occurs in the child of cystic fibrosis that is due to staph aureus yes hemophilus influenza is also known to cause infections in cystic fibrosis okay pseudomonas aeruginosa can also lead to severe infections in cases of cystic fibrosis but if they ask you the most important or most specific organism then the answer should be Burkholderia cepacea. So Burkholderia cepacea is known to cause severe infections in cases of cystic fibrosis characteristically. Okay. Along with that, the child can further progress to having sinusitis as well as there would be presence of nasal polyps. So this is also important. The case history can also even mention about sinusitis, nasal polyps and a important feature that is bronchiectasis. So please remember bronchiectasis is very severe lung infection wherein there is production of copious amount of cuff or sputum okay bronchiectasis is a sequel of cystic fibrosis mainly along with that there can be a pancreatic insufficiency mainly in the exocrine function of the pancreas there would be insufficiency right so please remember pancreatic exocrine insufficiency is seen that is why the pancreatic enzymes are not produced properly and that can land up the child in malabsorption syndrome and this malabsorption 
can cause indigestion of fats which leads to finally steatorrhea that is greasy and bulky stools are seen right along with that also the liver would be affected where there would be higher chances of neonatal jaundice please remember the child can even suffer from meconium ileus okay there can be also intestinal obstruction syndrome which is noted in this children right so various other organs are also affected in cystic fibrosis apart from the respiratory system but the most common cause of death in cystic fibrosis is mostly due to the involvement of respiratory system or respiratory failure if i talk about diagnosis guys this is very characteristic usually for diagnosis we do a sweat chloride test okay for diagnosis we do a sweat chloride test and the sweat chloride levels would be elevated okay the sweat chloride levels are generally elevated and that is why the sweat will taste salty okay and this is a very characteristic feature that is mentioned in the clinical case scenarios the mother was kissing the baby and it uh, the child is tasting salty or maybe the skin of the child is tasting salty or the other description of this particular thing can be there is crystallization of salt which is seen over the skin of the baby so both of these are due to the raised levels of sweat chloride apart from this as it is a genetic condition definitely genetic testing that is cytogenetics can be performed okay with the help of which we can find the gene mutations which are diagnostic of cystic fibrosis if i talk about treatment guys now definitely if the child is suffering from various recurrent infections the child would be treated with antibiotics right apart from that chest physiotherapy is recommended as there is a lot of recurrent infections like bronchiectasis which produces copious amount of cough therefore chest physiotherapy is usually recommended this children if there is severe respiratory distress maybe oxygen supplementation can also be required at times apart from this for pancreatic insufficiency we usually prefer giving pancreatic enzymes to this child right please remember so all of these are the treatment regime that is usually preferred in cases of cystic fibrosis but the important things that you need to remember first of all autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance cftr gene mutation on 7q chromosome right there would be recurrent infections nasal polyps even there can be azoospermia and infertility which is noted in males of cystic fibrosis please remember this okay there can be pancreatic exocrine insufficiency leading to malabsorption and steatorrhea further there can be meconium ileus which can be described in a neonatal history sweat chloride levels would be elevated and cytogenetic study is preferred in this children okay with this i come to the end of this session thank you so much and let's meet you in another session till that take care keep preparing and uh, if any issues please feel free to contact us at any point of time